In this tutorial we're going to look at electrical relationships. The first aim is explain how to calculate charge, then describe the relationship between current, voltage and resistance, and finally we're going to explain how to calculate power. Have you ever considered how batteries work? Now, considering there is evidence to suggest that batteries were first developed in 600 BC, it's quite surprising how many people don't actually know how they work. Well, firstly, the correct term for a battery is a cell. And if you look at a cell, it has two terminals, a positive end, which we call the anode, and a negative end, which we call the cathode. You may remember this from electrolysis. And also, just as in electrolysis, there's an electrolyte, a solution which contains charged particles. Now what happens in a battery is that there are chemical reactions that occur which force electrons towards the anode. Now electrons are negatively charged and they don't like being near each other, they all want to space themselves out. But these chemical reactions prevent that from happening so they continue to bunch up over here. And as long as these chemical reactions continue to occur you'll get this bunch up here. Now the problem is these electrons can't go this way because of these chemical reactions. They could however escape this way and travel to the cathode if there was a suitable pathway to do so. A conducting wire offers such a pathway so these electrons can now space themselves out and travel to the cathode. This also explains why batteries eventually run out of power. You see, eventually the reactants involved in these chemical reactions run out and so therefore these electrons can no longer be bunched up to one side, creating that push due to their alike charges. So you often hear voltage uh, referred to as a push, and now you can understand why. It's the push from these negatively charged electrons repelling each other. It's also important to remember that batteries, or cells rather, are a source of direct current. In other words, they push electrons in one direction around the circuit. This can be represented on a cathode ray oscilloscope trace. This is not a direct current because you can see the current is going from negative to positive. That would imply it's going one way around the circuit and the other way. This is an alternating current picture and you would expect this uh, if you attached a generator to our circuit. A direct current will only be in one of the areas of the trace, either positive or negative. So this could be a direct current or this could be a direct current. A truly direct current will only have a straight line, it'll only produce a straight line because it's a constant source of power. However, sometimes you can get pulsating traces which will also be regarded as direct current because they're in one area of the trace, either positive or negative. The point is they don't cross between the two. So by now you should be familiar that electricity is due to a flow of electrons, those negatively charged particles that whiz around the nucleus of atoms. Now, if you remember, in non-metals, those electrons are basically confined to the orbits or the shells around the nuclei, but in metals, they're free to flow between them. Because electrons can move in metals, they conduct electricity. Now it's important to note that electrons carry charge. To be more specific, they carry a negative charge. So electrons are charge carriers. Now the amount of charge that a single electron carries is so small it's virtually impossible to detect with equipment we have. So to measure charge we have to bunch electrons together until we can actually detect a reading of charge. When we amass a certain amount of electrons that give us a detectable reading of charge, we call that one coulomb of charge, measured in coulombs, which is given this unit C. So one coulomb of charge is the detectable amount of charge a packet of electrons carry. So as electrons flow through wires, they basically carry their charge, so you can assume that charge is also flowing down the wire. The amount of charge that flows through a wire or a circuit component can be calculated by multiplying current by time. So a question you might get may be something like this. If 3 amps of current flows through a bulb in 2 seconds, how much charge has passed through the bulb? Well, first we need to plug in an ammeter. That's a device that measures current. Current is measured in amps or amperes, just in case you weren't sure how to spell it. So an ammeter measures how much current passes over time. So we have to time two seconds. One, two. So over this time, there's been a certain flow of charged particles. This is referred to as current. So we simply multiply current, three amps, by time, two seconds. Three times two would be six coulombs of charge. 
So current can be defined as the rate of flow of charge around circuit. In other words, how much charge flows over time. So, for example, if 600 coulombs of charge passes through an electric heater over 10 minutes, calculate the current flowing through the heater. Well, firstly, 600 coulombs, that's your charge, that's 600 divided by the time. Now, the time has to be in seconds, so here it says 10 minutes. So, 10 minutes would be 10 times 60, that would be 600 seconds. So, 600 divided by 600 would give you 1 amp. And that would be the current. So that is how you explain how to calculate charge. So now let's look at the relationship between voltage, current and resistance. Voltage is often referred to as electrical pressure. A voltage is needed to push the charge carriers, those electrons, around a circuit. In other words, if you have no push or no voltage, you get no current. Now you may have seen a number of different ways of modelling electricity, but this is probably the best one or the safest one to stop you tripping up. You can think of voltage or potential difference in terms of water slides. Now forget about electricity for a second and just think about it in these terms. Imagine you're climbing up a ladder to get to the top of the water slide. What you've done here is you've gained gravitational potential energy. In other words, you are at a height and from that position, that energy can be transferred into other forms. Like if you jumped off, it would transfer to kinetic energy, movement energy. So by climbing up the ladder, you gain a potential energy. Now as you slide down the water slide, that energy is transferred to different forms. For example, you'll get movement energy, kinetic energy. You'll get heat and sound as you rub against the side of the plastic tubing. So all that gravitational potential energy will have been transferred. So you have none by the time you're at the bottom again. So then you have to climb up the ladder again to regain the energy so you can complete this process again. So in this model, we can assume that the ladder is like the cell, because as you pass through it, you gain energy. But not gravitational potential energy, here it would be electrical potential energy. In terms of our battery, if you remember, it means our electrons are being bunched up near each other and they really want to repel each other, that's where the push comes from. The water slide itself is like a circuit component where energy is transferred out of the system. So, in other words, it's this bit here. This is a resistor. So as we pass through the resistor, that energy is transferred and we're left with no energy at this point. Other charge carriers behind will cause us to be pushed forward to get to the cell again. So if you imagine that each of these people represent a coulomb of charge, what voltage is effectively is the amount of energy transferred from or to each coulomb of charge. So in other words, in the cell, energy is transferred to each coulomb of charge. So as every person travels up here, they gain energy. Individually, they gain energy. But as they move through the circuit component, each coulomb of charge transfers its energy out of the system. So in other words, a voltage is the amount of energy each coulomb carries. So one volt is referred to as one joule per coulomb of charge. Remember, joule is a unit for energy. So a volt is really energy per coulomb, joules per coulomb. Sometimes in exams, they get a multiple tick box question where you have to remember what is another way of expressing one volt. And it's one joule per coulomb. They may do this for power as well, but with power, it's one joule per second. But we'll look at that a bit later on. But you may be aware that cells come in all shapes and sizes. And a way of thinking of different voltage cells is thinking about how long that ladder is. You see, the longer the ladder, the more gravitational potential energy our water park dwellers will pick up as they move up the ladder. This is akin to having cells of different voltages. There'll be more of a push from a 6-volt cell than there would be from a 4-volt cell. Do also remember that all the energy the charge carriers acquire must be transferred throughout the circuit, so by the time they get back to the cell, they have nothing. So that's why if you were to attach a 6-volt cell into a circuit which previously had a 2-volt cell, the bulb glows brighter rather than glowing the same amount and the excess energy being stored and carried forward. It doesn't work like that. All the energy must be used. Also, the more power-hungry a circuit component is, you can think of it a bit like the steepness of a water slide. A shallow water slide would be a less power-hungry circuit component than a steep water slide. You'd be transferring more energy on this one than this one. 
So now let's introduce the concept of resistance, which is measured in ohms, and it's given the Greek omega symbol. And resistance is anything in a circuit that slows the flow down, slows the current down. So, for example, we could add resistance in this analogy by removing the water. If we remove the water, you can imagine our swimmers basically have a problem getting down. They'll get stuck against here, they'll move much more slowly, there'll be more friction. In a real-world context, resistance is increasing the circuit by putting more thin wires. For example, bulbs have thin wires and resistors have thin wires. Thin wires basically cause electrons to be crammed into a smaller space, so they basically rub against each other, there's more electrical friction. So uh, circuit components with high levels of resistance will transfer more energy as the electrons rub against each other and transfer more heat to the environment. The key thing here is that current potential difference, in other words voltage, and resistance are all linked together. They're all dependent on each other. If you alter one of these figures, you'll affect the other. So the greater the push, the greater the electrical push, in other words the greater the voltage or the potential difference, the faster the flow of current, so current increases. However, the greater the resistance, and here I've drawn hurdles, so one hurdle would offer two ohms of resistance, two hurdles would be four ohms, and three hurdles, six ohms. If you can imagine hurdles on a racetrack, the more there are, the slower the runner is on the racetrack. The point is we're putting more obstacles into our circuit, more bulbs, more resistors, whatever it may be, they're all working together to slow the overall current down. In other words, to have a high current, we need a high voltage and a low resistance. If we have a low voltage and a high resistance, our overall current will be low. And this mathematically makes sense. So if we started off with a voltage of 6 volts and a resistance of 2 ohms, the current would be 6 divided by 2, which would be 3, um, 3 amps. But if we had 6 ohms of resistance, 6 divided by 6 would be 1 amp. So by raising the resistance, we've lowered the current. Another very important point to note is current is always conserved. So here I've got a circuit. It's a simple series circuit, just a loop circuit. I've got two ammeters here which measure current and a resistor with the value of 2 ohms. The point is in a simple loop circuit or series circuit, the current is the same all the way around the circuit. Now this may be a bit confusing because I say that when they come out of the cell they have a bigger push and they have less energy when they've gone through the circuit components so wouldn't these ones move slower than these ones? Well the fact is it's a whole massive queue of electrons. The speed of these electrons are limited by the speed of these ones so they all move at the same rate. What's interesting is when we open up a new pathway for these charge carriers. So if I attach another loop here, so now I have two circuits in parallel. In other words, here's one circuit and here's the second circuit. The current splits at this junction. So half the current will go down this pathway and half this pathway. So our 4 amp splits into 2 amps down this pathway and 2 amps down this pathway. And where they meet again, then the current joins up to produce 4 amps. Again, current is conserved, it's not being lost, it's just splitting up and then joining again. Now for an added hurdle. You may have noticed in the previous example the resistances were the same. But now I'm going to attach a circuit which has a higher resistance in one of the loops than the other. You can see this one has a lower resistance than this one here. Because there's more opposition to current down this pathway, more current will flow through this pathway. We'll look at the specific calculations in another tutorial. But for now, let's just say that 2.67 amps flow down the pathway with least resistance, whereas 1.33 amps flow down the pathway with more resistance. In other words, the pathway which has the greatest amount of resistance will have the lowest current. So that's how you describe the relationship between current, voltage and resistance. So now let's look at power and energy transfer. First, we will look at power. Your first awareness of when you look at power is when you're changing a light bulb or looking at light bulb power ratings. Power is measured in watts, and here we have a 40 watt bulb. Basically, this bulb will transfer the electrical energy flowing through the wires to the surroundings as heat and light. The quicker it does this, the more powerful it is, and the brighter it glows. So you can see a 60 watt bulb basically draws more electrical current every second and therefore transfers more electricity or more electrical energy into heat and light so it glows brighter. But also as a result it draws more energy from the cell so the cell will drain faster. So all electrical appliances convert energy. 
our bulb, as I said, converts electrical energy into light and heat. Power is really a measure of how much energy they convert in one second. So you can see in this simple diagram, a 40 watt bulb transfers less energy in a second, a 60 watt bulb transfers more, and an 80 watt bulb transfers the most here. So the textbook definition of power is the amount of energy transferred by an appliance in one second. For that reason, power is measured in joules per second. Joules is a unit of energy and seconds a unit of time. So how much energy is transferred over time? To simplify things, we call one joule per second one watt. So the unit of electrical power is a watt. So you remember current is the rate of flow of charge. So how much charge is flowing past a point every second? And voltage is the amount of energy the charge carriers carry, the electrons carry. So let's say in one second this specific bulb draws this much current. So we can see those charge carriers have passed this point but now they don't have their energy because it's been transferred by the bulb. A 60 watt bulb will draw more current in the same amount of time, in one second. So more charge carriers with their energy will pass this point in one second. This is why it glows brighter. So we can just work out power by multiplying current and voltage. So in this circuit experiment, I just want to work out the power rating of this bulb. Now the current in a loop circuit will be the same all the way throughout the circuit. So our ammeter tells us that the current in this circuit is 0.4 amps. The current reading will always be a lot lower than the voltage reading, generally speaking. Now to measure the voltage or the energy transferred by this bulb, we need a voltmeter connected in parallel. So the voltmeter measures the energy that the charge carriers have at this point and the energy after going through the component. A handy tip to remember is all the energy the charge carriers have must be used before they return to the battery. So if this is the only component they have to deal with, then all the energy will be transferred by this bulb. That's why it says zero here. And the voltmeter just gives you a reading, which is the difference in energy between these two points. So the reading will say 3 volts. So let's assume in this example that these electrons represent 0.4 amps of current. And let's say that each electron or charge carrier is carrying 3 volts of energy, as is supplied by the cell in the circuit. So literally, as they pass through, you are multiplying 3 volts by 0.4 amps. And that will give you a power rating of 1.2 watts. So it's really simple. Just look for the current reading in the question, the volt reading in the question, or potential differences it may be called, and multiply them together. That's an easy two or three marks. Don't forget your units as well. Remember, power is measured in watts. Now, to understand energy transfer, the amount of energy a circuit component transfers depends on its power rating and how long it's left on for. So you know when you look at the power rating labels on different electronic devices, you get a number like 60 watts or 100 watts or whatever. This is the power rating, and if you think how long you leave these devices on for, that will affect the amount of energy those devices transfer, and also will affect how much you pay in your electricity bill. Now, energy transferred can be calculated very simply by multiplying power by time. But when you consider power is just voltage times current, you can also calculate energy transfer by potential difference or voltage multiplied by current multiplied by time. This is the formula you get on the front of your exams currently. So let's give this one worked example. If some hair straightener is attached to a main supply of with 230 volts are left on for 10 minutes and a current of 0.5 amps flows through them, how much energy do they transfer? Well, we know that the voltage is 230 volts, that's potential difference there, and we know that the current is 0.5 amps, so multiply by 0.5 amps, and then finally, 10 minutes. Now, time always has to be in seconds, so 10 minutes is 10 times 60 seconds, which is 600 seconds. So 230 volts times 0.5 amps current times 600 seconds time. And if you do that, you get a value of 69,000 joules, or if you divide by 1,000, 69 kilojoules. These are all very simple plug-in and calculate formulae. They're all at the front of your exam as well, so don't panic too much about learning them off by heart yet. And that is how you explain how to calculate power and energy transfer.